Welcome to Independent Sources. I'm Gary Pierre-Pierre. And I'm Diana Ravinka. Even though a health care reform bill has passed the House of Representatives, the debate is far from over and will continue to make the front pages at least of mainstream media. In-depth reporting on health care reform is difficult to find in ethnic and immigrant media, despite issues of particular concern to the communities they serve, like coverage for the uninsured and undocumented. Journalists in ethnic media say they face obstacles like expense, lack of expertise, and lack of access to those who make or influence policy. On this edition of Independent Absolutely. Sources, uh, we learn about we some efforts to educate the ethnic media about covering a complex issue like health care. We get a sense of what's being said about the census in some ethnic and immigrant communities. And we meet some Nigerian entrepreneurs in the U.S. who do business in both countries. Those stories and news of the week after this. Over the years, I've had the chance to talk to ethnic media, to be able to understand that they speak to an audience all across the city of New York. There are some, you know, people who will only who aren't going to read the Daily News or the New York Times, but they're reading your paper. The fate of health care reform now rests with the Senate, and the story will undoubtedly get extensive mainstream coverage in the coming weeks. I recently talked with Trudy Lieberman and Juana Ponce de Leon about ways to improve coverage in the ethnic media. Lieberman heads the Health and Medicine Reporting Program at the CUNY Graduate School of Journalism. She and her students have designed a website to educate the Bronx community about diabetes. Ponce de Leon is executive director of the New York Community Media Alliance, an ethnic media advocacy organization. Trudy Lieberman, you've been working on a project called Diabetes Dialogue. Can you tell us what it is? Sure. The uh, health and medicine students that I have been teaching at CUNY for the past few years have been working very hard in the South Bronx, particularly in Mott Haven and Hunts Point really getting to know the community so that we can construct this website that is going to deal with all aspects of diabetes. And it is going to be reaching adults as well as kids. For example, we've had uh, food diaries that some uh, middle schoolers have kept that shows the kinds of foods they're eating, and we've had a nutritionist evaluate uh, their diets. And some of them are really not very good. And we have other things on the site that will appeal to other kinds of uh, people, older people, say um, recreation opportunities. So we give an evaluation of all the recreation activities in that area mm -hmm. and how much they cost and what do they offer. So what we're trying to do is build a real one-stop shopping service for people in the community to deal with their diabetes and then hopefully to prevent it. Well, diabetes is a, is a beginning of, of, of a chain of other ailments you can have. Who's your target audience uh, in this project? Uh, Hispanic communities, and mm -hmm. the uh, site is largely geared to younger people, but there's a lot on there for their parents as well. Because what we're finding is most of these students that we've been interviewing, doing slideshows and audio slideshows and conversations with, have a parent or an aunt or some other relative, a grandma, who's had the disease and, and may have even died from the disease. Mm -hmm. So they're pretty well versed in it. And this, this, is this a site uh, when it's fully operational that can be a reference point for ethnic media journalists to, to, to use the information in there? Absolutely. Uh, we'll have the site pretty operational by uh, December, January, and then we plan marketing campaign after that to get it into the community, to get it used, and we will be using the ethnic media as a way to disseminate information that is in the site and help us to get the word out. Speaking of disseminating disseminating information, Juana, you, uh, your organization, the New York Community Media Alliance, or NICMA as we call it, has been uh, generating a lot of uh, workshops and uh, giving ethnic media access to uh, the leaders in the, com in, in the city and community as well. Uh, recently, you had something, a, a press presser as we call it, uh, with uh, Representative Rangel in Harlem. Talk about that specific uh, news conference, if you will, and the, the broader uh, goal of NICMA. Well, we reached out to 
uh, Congressman Rangel because we felt that there was a, a lot of misinformation uh, about the health care um, reform mm -hmm. proposals and, uh, that like are being considered. Be, uh, and um, typically, uh, the ethnic and community media are not uh, engaged in public education campaigns, so we felt it was absolutely necessary to have uh, Congressman Rangel come and say, this is what we're doing and this is what we're not doing. And, uh, Can you give us a was sense the of how you were able to clarify some of the miscommunications or misinformation, rather, that has been flowing out there? Well, I, I mean, it's not that I've been able to clarify anything. It's more <laughs> bringing the, 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 the folks that have the information to the media so that they, they were able, for instance, I mean, in, this com in, the, in the communities represented by the ethnic media, uh, there is a, uh, a, a real concern for many of their family members and friends that are not documented and wondering, for instance, if there was any consideration uh, about them in what was going on. And, and uh, you know, Congress Congressman Rangel said without any, you know, hesitation that they, they are not being considered, uh, but then iterated pretty quickly how uh, hospital emergency rooms and so on were, were available. Um, there was also a, a, the, uh, the concern about um, immigration reform okay. uh, sort of falling falling into a second place. It seems like immigration reform is part of health care reform now uh, somehow uh, intertwined. Uh, do you think Trudy there can be real uh, health care debate without addressing the illegal immigration immigrants if you will? Well what's happened and Juan is correct about this <clears throat> that uh, undocumented uh, immigrants will not be able to get coverage under this particular bill that's being discussed. They, uh, it's still up in the air whether they will be able to buy through something called an exchange, kind of a big brokerage shopping service, but they would not be entitled to subsidies to help them buy insurance coverage. And I think it's important for people to understand that under what's being considered right now is called something called an individual mandate. Okay. Now that's jargon, and what it really means is that everybody's going to have to have health insurance. You either get it from your employer or Medicaid or Medicare, or you go out and buy it. And if you don't have it, what happens? Is there a penalty? Penalties. And right now the Congress is debating how severe those penalties will be. So I think that a lot of people served by the ethnic media are going to find themselves kind of caught in this, they're going to have to get insurance, and if they are undocumented, there will be no subsidies to help them. Uh, Juana, uh, I guess if we follow what, and then we, we agree with what Trudy has just said, that this is going to be really important. So how is the ethnic media in general covering these issues and, and, and providing information for their readers and their viewers? Well, the ethnic media, um, because they don't have direct access to the folks that are deliberating this policy and so on, um, often reiterate what's being said in mainstream. Uh, hence, the importance of bringing someone like Congressman Rangel directly to them so that they can ask questions. Um, but there's also there's also um, a I would see a pretty ubiquitous stance in terms of healthcare, which is that it, it is a moral, um, a moral obligation okay. to take care of everyone. You know, they're saying this is, this is, you know, they say the richest country in the world, blah, blah, blah. You know, that, that it is, it, it's a right, it's a human right, it's a moral obligation. And that's pretty, pretty straight across the line with, uh, you know, with the, within the different communities. Trudy, I mean, I've heard this before when people have talked about the health care is, is a morality thing. It's a, it's a basic human right. Do you agree with that? Well, obviously I do, but there are lots of people who don't. And that's what part of the hullabaloo has been about, particularly this summer during all that town hall stuff that was going on. A lot of Americans do not want to give coverage to undocumented immigrants. And I think that we have had a historical aversion to this sort of thing uh, for ages in this country. I mean, just think back to all the different waves of immigration that we've had. 
And so I think that in order to get buy-in from large segments of the American population. Members of Congress have just said no subsidies for these people. Mm -hmm. Juana, now immigrants and immigration have become the focal point of this health care debate. Now what can the ethnic media do to better cover this motivational uh, topic that's getting everybody so uh, excited about it one way or the other? I think that um, you know, having more uh, press conferences where you bring in uh, advocates, where you bring in someone like Trudy, so on, so that they can ask their questions. Because I think that the, the the most important thing is to promote critical thinking around issues, and and uh, that can't happen in a vacuum or where the the stream of information is so. Um, um, Weakened, you know, it's not it's not robust. It's not uh, a good back and forth. So I think that um, in terms of NICMA, you know, our intention really is to um, try to create these briefings, these press briefings, not only on health issues. You know, come you know ostensibly come uh, January after the whole health care debate is over. You know, it will be the immigration thing. So bringing in um, Senator Charles Schumer, okay. who will be heading up that whole thing. You know, so the, the 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 only thing that they can really do is to have real information and be accurate. We're going to have to leave it at that <coughs> because obviously this is an issue that's going to be going on for quite some time. Judy Lieberman of the CUNY Graduate School of Journalism, thank you for being here. Thank you. Juana Ponce de Leon of NICMA, New York Community Media Alliance, thanks for being with us. Thank you. Now here's Alana Rigal with some other news. Thanks, Vianora. Here's a look at some headlines from the ethnic media. From New America Media, the electoral victory of two Democrats in the U.S. House of Representatives could mean the long-awaited advancement in immigration reform House Democrats claim to strongly advocate. House Democrats presented President Obama with a letter reaffirming their commitment to reform immigration policies. They say a reform bill needs to be introduced and put into effect early in 2010 if it is to succeed. The World Journal reports that a different wave of migration is occurring in Brooklyn Sunset Park. Chinese parents are sending their babies back to China to be raised there, while they remain in the U.S. to work and earn money. Chinese parents in the neighborhood say they wouldn't send their infant children home if their extended family were here in America. From the Amsterdam News, people are upset that New York Marathon winner Meb Keth Lesge wasn't born in the United States. Some say they feel no patriotic association with Kev Lesge, who was born in Eritrea, but is a naturalized American citizen. Others question whether the negative response to his win is because of the fact that he is black. From NNPA, more efforts are being made to get black males into universities and help them stay there. The Center for African American Male Research, Success and Leadership and several universities are providing more support groups for entering black male students, teaching them better study habits and encouraging them to continue their studies in school. According to the Journal of Blacks in Higher Education, only 44% of black males graduate from college. Those are just a few headlines from the ethnic media. We'll be right back. It'll help immigrants because now immigrants can actually be counted. And instead of hiding and, and, and being afraid and being, you know, being afraid to give up their information and being afraid to say that they're here illegally or whatever may have you, it, it gives them an opportunity to be counted so that, you know, for the upgrade of whatever neighborhood and environment they live in. If uh, Native American or the Americans which uh, which born here, like who are the citizens of America, if they can participate, then we are living here. We do not have like a permanent status, but as a human right, that is, if they got it, then we can we we can have it. You know. It's still several months before the Census Bureau sends out forms and dispatches hundreds of thousands of workers to count the number of people in the U.S. Despite increased efforts, the government acknowledges that this may be one of the toughest counts yet, especially in ethnic and immigrant communities, where many people remain fearful of providing information to the government. To talk about some of the issues surrounding the census in these communities, I'm joined by sociology professor Andrew Beveridge and journalist Felicia Persaud and Andrei Dobrovolsky. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
Over the past few days, we witnessed a GOP attempt to require the 2010 census um, to forms to ask people whether or not they're American citizen. Let's talk about this proposal and its impact. Felicia, you wrote in an article, you called this proposal an idiocy. How surprised really were you to hear about it and the undocumented immigrants being again um, coming again into discussion on the political agenda? Well, not surprised at all. I mean, the GLP's anti-immigrant rhetoric has uh, completely, completely alienated immigrants, and that wasn't a surprise. What is a surprise is that it's coming so close to the census in 2010 when so many, it's already difficult to have undocumented immigrants actually participate, and that's been an ongoing issue for a lot of immigrant leaders for the census itself. And one of their major uh, talking points around this was the fact that immigrants do not have to say whether they're legal or illegal. And that has kind of, you know, helped to, to, to curb a lot of the concern. And so, so for the senator to come out with something like this at this last minute, it's selfish and it's completely racist. Andre, what did you think when you first heard about the proposal? Did you think it was uh, uh, political or did you think anti-immigration? I think that it was mostly political issue because it was part of the game. It was part of the fight for seats in the House because, as we know, the, co the, the results of census determine and the, the senator from Louisiana was concerned that his uh, districts or his state will lose some, some seats uh, while, for example, Texas or New York or California would gain something. Did it so have it was any not very impact in the Polish community? It was not a very emotional issue because we didn't believe that he will be able to succeed with doing it. And uh, I think that the Polish, uh, ori that Senator Barbara Mikulski, who is of Polish origin, uh, talked to the senator and, and she said that it w he had a lot of time to do it. Uh, before, particularly, it was uh, it was April when he could address this issue. Andrew Beveridge, you're an expert on census issues. What impact, if any, do you think this proposal has on the 2010 census? I think there's two things. First off, uh, when Bitter originally proposed it, he actually proposed uh, saying, "Don't count undocumented." And then when people pointed out that that would that like was a non-starter because they've never asked whether or not you were here legally on the census. It's never happened. Uh, he then modified it and said, okay, just ask what, whether they're citizens. But the undergirding idea of it was to try to undercut apportionment uh, for, for non-citizens. In other words, it was going to cut, it would actually lose, New York's probably going to lose one seat. It would make New York lose a second congressional seat. But I think even more important than that, if in fact this went through and if in fact uh, non-citizens were dropped from reapportioned redistricting, New York City would lose more than one state senator, two assemblymen, mm -hmm. basically a congressman, and the, and the immigrant neighborhoods, whether or not they're uh, Caribbean, Hispanic, Polish, all of them would have much less power you know, in, right. the, in the equation. And now that the law didn't pass, what impact do you think well, it would have on I the I think system? now it's going to make people nervous. I mm -hmm. completely agree with Felicia because the last time around, uh, the, a lot of the immigrant communities in New York actually participated very well in the census. And I mean, you had to remember at that point, Giuliani was mayor, and he famously said, this was before he ran for president, but he famously said, uh, I like, love immigrants, legal or illegal. And, uh, you know, we've come a long way from that. I mean, you know, like the idea that we're welcoming to immigrants and that we would like to have immigrants. I mean, up until the early 20s, immigrants could vote in state elections, state and local elections, and I actually think that that would be a very good thing because they're here. They mm -hmm. really are citizens. Felicia and Andre, you both lobbied for your group's ethnic identity to be specified on the census forms. How significant is that for each of you? Felicia? Right now for Caribbean nationals, we're very concerned because we just do not have, the, we, our story really cannot be told in economic numbers. And that is a concern for our community because our media cannot grow. A lot of organizations are not getting the funding that they need because they are saying Caribbean nationals are just a minute less than 1% nationally, when in fact there are a whole lot more when you just look at 3 million people on Eastern Parkway. 
So we really want to make sure not just Caribbean nationals, but I think all immigrants, including Polish, um, whether they're from, from Iraq, from wherever, that they should have the option to actually write in their country of origin on census forms, whether they're the ACS or the actual census forms. Andre, why would that be important to the Polish community? And I think that it will be impor important for the same reasons. And uh, besides, uh, I think that it would give us more political power if we are considered as a, a group who, which, which has 10, 11 million. Uh, last uh, census in uh, 2000, uh, the Polish American Congress, which is a leading organization of the Polish community, said that we were undercounted, that we are perhaps are the undercounted for million people. So it is a, a serious, serious difference between 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 the what 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 the census said and mm -hmm. what is the real uh, number of the Polish Americans. And in. Andrew, what would be the implication of such a change? Is that practical? I think it is practical. In fact, Reynolds Farley, who's a famous demographer at the University of Michigan, has argued that they should take the race question, the Hispanic question, and what's now called the ancestry question, which is only on the uh, long form, or now the ACS, and wrap it into one question. So you would get both the racial identification of the person and their origin. However, just I, we don't really want to ask, we don't want to know, uh, we really don't want, we want to know if they're citizens of the United States, but we don't want to really, we don't really care if they're citizens of Poland or, or Guyana or Jamaica or wherever uh, on, for the U.S., but we do, would like to know where they, what, what the origin is. Felicia, in an article you wrote, you said that you advise all immigrants, given this proposal now, to really come out now more than ever and uh, fill out the forms, to send a message to the GOP and those who are anti-immigration. Do you think that this will happen in the next census? We hope so. I think a lot more organizations are getting involved. I mean, the census is going to be spending uh, $300 million on its promotion. They're doing a lot more outreach than we've seen in 2000. And um, I think it's up to us in the ethnic media, in the organizations where we're, you know, we have our groups to really make sure that this happens because I think that really is the key to uh, ensuring that everyone recognizes the power of immigrants in this country. Andre, does this uh, example, this proposal signal uh, a need for a sooner overhaul of the immigration policy? Oh, certainly, because these two issues are connected, and I think that, that the whole tight argument is about immigration reform, and if it is not passed uh, in the next future, we'll have similar problem in 10 years, even if we have a lot of time to deal with this issue. No, we have, first of all, we have to fight for the immigration reform. And Andrew, um, let me bring up here uh, the National Association of Latino elected and appointed officials who argued that this proposal invokes a time when slaves were counted by the census as a three-fifths of a person. Have we witnessed now with this proposal uh, uh, a step backwards? Well, that's what he was trying. And I mean, you have to also remember that Native Americans weren't counted at all unless they lived among whites. Uh, so yeah, I do believe that that's what he was trying. And, and the virulence of the sort of anti-immigration that it stirred up is just quite amazing. And so I do think that these sorts of things are very, very, uh, un, you know, very much undercut. In terms of immigration reform, if we did have immigration reform and it made it easier for people to become citizens, uh, they should immediately register and vote. I mean, they should come out with a census. If they are citizens, they should register and vote because that's the second way that you can really uh, exert power in the United States. Well, that's all the time we have for today. Professor Andrew Beveridge, Felicia Brousseau, and Andre Dobrovolsky. Thanks for being here. We'll be right back after this. They're in the community. The community serves them as well. The money is also needed for them too. They live here. Why not? Right? They should have a chance. Some of them don't even have a chance to vote. Okay. So they should participate in something. We end our show with a story about some immigrant entrepreneurs. The U.S. may be springing back from the recession, but Nigerian business owners are traveling back and forth between this country and their homeland where business is booming. 
Abby Ishola, spoke with two Nigerian entrepreneurs and an American journalist who say Africa is where the money is. Atim Altun is part owner of Calabar Imports, a small fashion and housing goods store in Prospect Heights, Brooklyn. For the past three years, she's been making crucial sacrifices to survive the tough economic times. I would say in 2006, the recession began. Okay, I knew that from looking at when we were selling jewelry. We sold jewelry at $40. We're selling jewelry at $25 and under. But business couldn't be better for her in Lagos, Nigeria. There, she owns a similar store that caters to Nigerian consumers. In Nigeria, as of this year and last year, and since we've begun, we've noticed a 400% upsurge. Uh, and we can't get products there fast enough. Oh, nosy. Any Tom so Balogun has seen the same course. sort of success. Since 2006, she's been traveling back and forth between her home in New York to her home in Nigeria. There, she sells her own makeup line that she manufactures in the U.S. You go to um, a store here, department stores, you see different makeup brands. We don't have stuff like that over there. So they, when they see it, they appreciate it. And that someone that's, you know, black, African, you know, Nigerian woman is doing something like they, they definitely want to support you. This doesn't surprise Rosalind McClymont, editor-in-chief of the Network Journal, a monthly magazine targeting black professionals in the U.S. She says Africa is the place to be in terms of business, so she encourages her readers to pursue business ventures there. They say that when the U.S. sneezes, the whole world gets a cold. We're in a recession, but things are hot in Africa. Why is that? Africa, number one, was not tied to the banking structure of Wall Street that caused the crisis. And Africa's economies have been growing. They have been outpacing the growth of the United States and of Europe and the developed countries uh, in general. This was confirmed in Nigeria back in 2007 when the Nigerian government declared that the country's economy was the fastest growing in the world. That year, Nigeria's GDP was over 300 billion U.S. dollars. That number increased by over 5% in 2008. Mainstream media in the U.S. took note. And you decided to be an entrepreneur here in Nigeria. I mean, you could have done the same thing, really, from the United States if you wanted to. Yes. But you chose to come home. CNBC's recent report titled Dollars in Danger, Africa, the Final Investing Frontier, highlights several business owners in Nigeria, some of whom once lived in America or Europe, but returned home to launch their companies. The report wasn't all positive. CNBC calls Nigeria dangerous territory, despite the country's limitless prospects for investments. Aton disagrees. There's a better quality of life there, um, even in the, you know, impression of chaos. Um, I know it when I go in there because I'm very, I'm completely at ease. It's my country, kind of. So it's a sense of ownership. Um, I sort of know what the rules are. It's those rules that keep her from the dangers as she remains focused on the opportunities. For independent sources, Abby Ashola. That's our show. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you again next week. In the meantime, be independent-minded. <laughs>